Why are we talking about Malcolm X, a man that died in 1965 on the 21st of February? We're talking about Malcolm X because in terms of where he stood as a revolutionary and in terms of somebody who stood as a fighter, he's worth remembering because I think some of the questions that he raised then in the end of his life are still posed in America today and still posed in Britain. There are people who talk about since the election of Obama that we live in a post-racist society. I actually think that what we're talking about is a racist offensive taking place today, both in America and in this country. And the question about how we fight and resist that, and the question about how we achieve liberation, is one of the questions that were raised inside the 60s and today. I think it's important that we listen to the man himself. Uh, I'm going to start with this from Malcolm X came to this country uh, in 1964 to discuss the election that took place inside Smethwick. And he made one of his final speeches here, which is an important speech. And I just want to start off with that and then go back to why I think there's six reasons why we should listen to Malcolm X. As long as a white man does it, it's all right. A black man is supposed to have no feelings. <laughs> But when a black man strikes back, he's an extremist. He's supposed to sit passively and have no feelings, be nonviolent, and love his enemy. No matter what kind of attack, be it verbal or otherwise, he's supposed to take it. But if he stands up and in any way tries to defend himself, <laughs> then he's an extremist. <laughs> No, I think that the uh, speaker who preceded me is getting exactly what he asked for. The, uh, <laughs> my reason for believing in extremism, intelligently directed extremism, extremism in defense of liberty, extremism in quest of justice is because I firmly believe in my heart that the day that the black man takes an uncompromising step and realizes that he's within his rights when his own freedom is being jeopardized to use any means necessary to bring about his freedom or put a halt to that injustice, I don't think he'll be by himself. I live in America where there are only 22 million blacks against probably 160 million whites. One of the reasons that I'm in no way reluctant or hesitant to do whatever is necessary to see that black people do something to protect themselves, I honestly believe that the day that they do, many whites will have more respect for them and that there will be more whites on their side than are now on their side with these little wishy-washy, love thy, love thy enemy uh, approach that they've been using up to now. And if I'm wrong, then you are racialists. <laughs> As I said earlier, uh, in my conclusion, I'm a Muslim. I believe in the religion of Islam. I believe in Allah, I believe in Muhammad, I believe in all of the prophets. I believe in fasting, prayer, charity, and that which is incumbent upon a Muslim to fulfill in order to be a Muslim. In April, I was fortunate to make the Hajj to Mecca and went back again in September to try and carry out my religious uh, functions and, and, and uh, requirements. But at the same time that I believe in that religion, I have to point out I'm also an American Negro. And I live in a society who, whose, whose uh, social system is based upon the castration of the black man, whose political system is based on castration of the black man, and whose economy is based upon the castration of the black man. A society which in 1964 has more subtle, deceptive, deceitful methods to make the rest of the world think that it's cleaning up its house, while at the same time the thing, same things are happening to us in 1964 that happened in 1954, 1924, and in 1984. They came up with what they call a civil rights bill in 1964, supposedly to solve our problem, and after the bill was signed, uh, three civil rights workers were murdered in cold blood. And the FBI uh, head, Hoover, admits that they know who did it. They've known ever since it happened, and they've done nothing about it. Civil rights bill down the drain. No matter how many bills pass, black people in that country 
where I'm from, still our lives are not worth two cents. And that's why I wanted to end it, where he started off by saying that black people's lives there in America are not worth two cents. Because when you went to Mike Brown's funeral, I went to Mike Brown's funeral inside St. Louis. I went to the place where Mike Brown was killed by a racist police officer and murdered. The question of, has things fundamentally changed? You'd have to say yes and no. Yes, there's a civil rights bill. Yes, people have got rights in what they, the way they operate. But nevertheless, what you'd have to say is America, Britain, and Europe remain deeply racist societies. And what he was arguing then, he was arguing about the question of extremism. Is extremism ever justified in terms of a fight against racism and a fight against change? Is moderation the way forward? And when you look at the extremism bill going through Parliament today, you begin to understand that what they're trying to do is silence the very movement that took place inside the 1960s. And I want to start off by beginning to explain the background of where Malcolm X um, um, got to where he was today. I think there's a reason why they have, they've attempted to re incorporate Malcolm X. There's a Malcolm X school, there's a Malcolm X stamp, there's a Malcolm X study centre. They've attempted to strip out the core of what he argued. And what I want to argue is that he argued several different things. That he was not, I would not argue that he was a socialist. I would argue that he was a revolutionary. I'd argue that he was an uncompromising fighter against racism, which is something which is indelibly built into the way that capitalist society operates. And towards the end of his life, he began to deal with very many of those questions that we need to deal with, still deal, deal, deal with today. Malcolm X was born in 1925. And in 1925, I hope I he's born Malcolm Little. And he's, the background to what was going on in America is very instructive to the background of his development. Because his father was in the United Negro Improvement Association, an organization run by a black nationalist by the name of Marcus Garvey. He was born in Jamaica, and he came up with a mass organization involving 300,000 people. And he, his, his slogan was, Up You Mighty Race. His father was a Baptist preacher as well. He was involved in a whole network of different things. But in the 1920s was a period of which... Because people came back from the First World War, they were beginning to change. There was mass migration from the south to the north. There's only three key things that really fundamentally matter inside America when it comes on to the question of the fight against racism. The American Civil War and the reconstruction that took place afterwards. The American Civil War is the biggest single loss of lives for America in terms of the question of what type of society they're going to have. It's the end, if you like, of the American bourgeois revolution. But part of that question was wrapped up with the question of slavery and racism. Racism isn't a consequence of just the mindset of people. It is the consequence of the way that capitalism organises. The rise of slavery in America was a consequence in terms of the way that capitalism needed black labour. It's part of the reason why America finds it much more difficult to change than actually many other countries. Britain and America share the same legacy in terms of that they were the, the forefathers of, of racism. You can go to Tate and Lyle and read the way that they, and Rothschilds and the rest of the banks, and read the way that they developed the slave trade and the formation of what I describe as racism as a modernity idea. There's nothing natural about racism. For, for, for Marxists, for socialists, we believe that racism is based on the way that capitalism develops competition that the, the nature of the way that capitalism developed. If you look at the American Constitution, it says that everybody's born free and equal under God. But the people that wrote that, Jefferson, were slave owners. In other words, they had to come up with a systematic way of distinguishing against people based on characteristics which were indelible. And that's part of the way that racism played a central part in, of, of both American society, both as an ideological way of controlling society and shaping it. The reason why racism has played a particular role in there is if you go back to the formation of the slave trade in, 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 uh, and the slavery inside America, there were revolts against slavery, the Bacon Revolt in particular. If you, I haven't got time to go through it, but the Bacon Revolt, where, where poor whites and slaves came together early on in the formation of America, and there was a danger that we're going to lose their labor. So they had to find a distinguishing way of describing who was going to stay a slave for life. They moved from indentured labor, there was a reshaping of how they put people. And I, that's the basis of what I describe as, a, as, 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 as racism. And I think a half a century after Malcolm X's assassination, it's worth reflecting that, um, what, his, what, his life, what his life meant. Um, his father was murdered by the equivalent of the Ku Klux Klan. 
He, his, his house had been burnt down twice. He was placed across a, a rail track and cut in half by the equivalent of um, a form of lynching because part of the United Negro Improvement Association was the idea that people could develop. And actually, so if you look at what's happened in Malcolm's life, actually he was confronted by the contradiction between the idea of the American dream and the nature of his life, where his father is murdered, his mother is driven into poverty, um, the four children, if you like, are taken away from him. Malcolm actually goes, grows up in many white households. He moves to Boston. He moves to all these different places. And actually, if you look at the 1920s, it was also a ferment of ideas. There was the United Negro Improvement Association, but there was also the Communist Party, the American Communist Party, that flowed into both the big cities in terms of ideas, in terms of shaping um, lives. If you read Manny Marable's book, he, he talks about a man called Ralph Ellison and Richard Wright. These were in the air. They, these were writers that wrote about the black experience in which were centres to the uh, 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 centre city. If you look at Malcolm's early life, what you find is that he ends up as a, a shoeshine boy or working inside jazz clubs. Jazz clubs, as we understand at that time, were the cutting edge of both theory, music and change, and they were integrated. Um, you know, he was... As he, as, he, as he grew up, he accepted the notions of, of how, how, how he was treated. He often, if you listen to his speech, he talks about how he's, he's, he looks at appearance of being mixed race. His hair is red. He, die, you know, he talks about straightening his hair. He goes through a whole period where he talks about developing a level of, a, 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 a level of, a level of consciousness. And he's involved in petty crime. Uh, he ends up going to Boston. He ends up going to um, Harlem. And eventually... Um, if you look at the nature of what was taking place in the 1940s, he was part of a group of people that ended up in places like Harlem. He ended up on, uh, running on trains, moving different parts of the, of, of the country. And really what you start to see is a, a young man that is um, challenging and changing. Why is he changing? Because this is the period to run up to the Second World War, which is called the Great Migration, where huge numbers of black people move from being sharecroppers into the city centres in order to work. I know it doesn't look like it now. I don't know if anybody's been to Detroit uh, recently. It looks like something out of one of those horror movies. Do you mean, you know, like the town's been destroyed or whatever it is. But if you think about Detroit, uh, do you mean New York or any of these towns, actually black people were far more liberated when they moved away from sharecropping. Why? Because if you're a sharecropper and you're, fo you're a sharecropper is somebody that works on the land on their own, growing crops in order to cut shears. If the local Klux Klan come, then actually they can intimidate you. If you move into the city centres, you begin to change. There's pictures, which I haven't got here, of people coming off the ships in the Second World War with a double V. Uh, that was a victory against fascism, but also a victory against uh, racism, which they experienced in the United States. They talked about people called the New Negro. Um, in other words, if you look at what's going on in, in America, you start to see the development of a black working class that's actually affected by the idea that you're allowed to arm yourself and allowed to fight back. In other words, the people that come back from the Second World War or during the Second World War are not the same downtrodden people and begin to change, uh, begin to change themselves. Um, Malcolm is um, sent to prison, essentially, for a burglary, but it's also he's got two white women in the car, and the judge actually says at the time, you've got two, you've got, you're wrong to have two white women in the car at the same time. And he gets an extra 10-year sentence, uh, sentence for that. And he actually tells you something about the nature of America then. But when people say he used to be described as the angriest black man in, in America, actually his history isn't untypical of the question of people that were, um, do you mean, if you like, in and out of employment. And actually when he goes to prison, his brother, Reggie, is influenced by the Nation of Islam. I'll just say something about the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam is a, a world rejectionist sect at the time. Uh, it was formed by a man called Fard. Um, it was led by Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad, who declares himself to be the Prophet Muhammad's um, uh, reflection on earth. But it's a, an organization that comes out, if you like, of the movement that, uh, that Garvey had set out. Garvey was the put forward the idea that black people have to have their own businesses, their own lives, and had to be able to shape this. Now, this doesn't sound particularly radical now when you've got a black president, but at that time, when in, in America, in 1943, there were 270 registered lynchings of, uh, of people. Uh, I don't know if people have heard the um, Strange Fruit. I mean, I think there was a rendition of it at last week's Glastonbury by Kenway West, 
where um, he, he, he um, where he played he played the same song. Actually, what you what you saw there really in terms of the uh, uh, development was um, when you're talking about uh, Malcolm X, he goes to prison. He goes through this experience where he feels isolated and broken. He joins the Nation of Islam because it offers him solace. When Marx talked about um, religion, he said that religion is the heart in the heartless world, the soul in soulless conditions. It is a means in which people can show and express themselves. And um, Malcolm X joins the Nation of Islam because it fills a hole in his life. It has order. It has. It gives the first thing that um, Elijah Muhammad does. He writes to him, not as a prisoner, but as somebody with a level of respect. He sends him five dollars and says, "You should respect yourself. You shouldn't take drugs. You shouldn't drink. You should order your life as a black Muslim." And the black Muslims, if you like, see themselves as a separate sect within American society. If you like, they reject the idea of a white god. Now, that in itself, in America at that time, was quite radical. And the, the speaker that comes forward for the number one is, is, Malcolm, is, is Malcolm X. The Nation of Islam had no more than maybe two, three hundred, uh, two, two, three hundred uh, people. But if you want to understand what else is going on in America, they're also going through the beginnings of the civil rights movement, the Montgomery bus boycott in, in the 19, uh, 1950s, led by Martin Luther King. Um, that led by a black woman, Rosa Parks, refusing to give up her, her seat. If you like, something was beginning to stir within the black community, in the black working class, that had been held back for hundreds of years in America. And there are two, there are two elements of it that started to develop very, very quickly. A mass movement led by people to desegregate the South. The South was, um, was still based on apartheid, was still based on the fact that black people couldn't vote. The North people still had the right, uh, the, right to have, um, the right to vote. But actually, when you look at the situation, 63% of black people, according to the later Kerner report that was published after the Watts uh, Rebellion, showed that black people were in a significant worse off position, even in the middle of uh, uh, a prosperous and booming America. And really what the civil rights movement does is begin to break up the whole McCarthyite, the witch hunting atmosphere that had, been, that had been built up, it began to shake up and give rise to a new left. A left that was much more confident in terms of talking about change. It was a multiracial movement that desegregated the South. And often people counterpose Malcolm X to Martin Luther King. They say that Martin Luther King put forward a, you know, a process in which people are, um, he called for mass demonstrations between 1952 to 1963, over 100 mass demonstrations are called, including the mass demonstration, the March on, on Washington, that leads to the 64 Civil Rights Bill. And part of that was a strategy which was called moral suasion. America was attempting, as it is today, to present itself. We see it all the time, don't we? It, people talk about our values. I mean, have, have people have heard this thing about British values of tolerance. Do you mean, you know, like the opium trade, the slave trade? Do you mean uh, the domination of three quarters of, of, of the world or the Vietnam War? They keep talking about where we believe in these special values. At that time, they were doing the same thing. It was during the middle of the Cold War. Um, there's a speech, a famous speech made by a man called Eisenhower, where he comes and says, we need to teach the world liberty. A man called Khrushchev, which people might not know, was a premier of USSR, turned around and said, well, why can't blacks in the southern states vote then? Do you mean, why don't you practice what you preach? In other words, and there was also a movement inside America, which was because of the loosening up, the need to change America, in the sense that America was growing as an economic powerhouse. It needed labor. It needed to stop treating the black labor um, simply as a slave labor, simply as sharecroppers. It wanted to develop them into something which is a bit, uh, uh, something was a bit more. So they became much more industrialized and changed. This contradiction in America led to certain changes. It led to the question of the levels of desegregation. The army's desegregated. Parts are desegregated. The only problem is people forgot to tell the Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats are the people that run the southern states, the democratic states. When you hear Bill Clinton come out with these lovely southern terms of, do you mean, in Alabama, how we love each other, and Arkansas and stuff like that, unfortunately, the tradition in those towns was still one which was based on reaction. But that movement, the 
the establishment of terror and fear was smashed by the mass movement that took place inside the civil rights movement. Even today, when you look at that movement, I, I think people have to understand the sheer scale of it to begin to understand how, um, why it led to uh, such an enormous, ch enormous change. And really, in, as that movement begins to grow, it begins to come up against a contradiction. In the North, black people have the right to vote. In the South, they don't. So an enormous movement's launched. But in that movement, the people that lead in that movement, like people like Martin Luther King, said, if blood must be shed, then it must be our blood. We have to persuade people through moral suasion. And tactically, that's the right thing. Sometimes when you're doing anti-fascist activity, people come to us and say, what should happen is a small group of us should take on the reactionaries, and by doing that, we'll demonstrate that we can change things. But when the state in Alabama, in Mississippi, is the National Guard, then actually that movement would have been crushed very early on if it had done that. The tactic of mass movement and embarrassing the federal government put forward by Martin Luther King was a mass movement that was effective up to that point. But the question of violence, of dealing with violence, was a significant point. So where does Mar uh, Malcolm X fit into this and where does the Nation of Islam fit into this? The Nation of Islam argued that you shouldn't be involved in politics. But nevertheless, it grew as people began to look for an alternative. And if you listen to uh, Malcolm X's speeches at the time, he talks about the inequalities in America, the hypocrisy in America. He charges the President of the United States of being the biggest hypocrite in the world. I don't think that's actually changed, actually. But nevertheless, he does a speaking tour across the country charging, um, charging um, the President as being the biggest hypocrite in the world. And what he talks about is the role of slavery, the impoverishment, the, um, the, the level of alienation faced by people. And between 1950, um, 1952 to 1960, to, to early 61, what you see is a process where, as this mass movement takes place, Malcolm X is involved in the discussions. Um, and a whole debate takes place about how to fight back and how to struggle. And Malcolm X's most famous um, slogan is, by any means necessary. And what I want to argue is that as the mass movement began to grow, it began to face impasses. It began to face the question about how do you actually change society? Do you use physical force? Do you use mass force? Or do you use individual, or do you use individual force? Now, the notion of the Nation of Islam was to argue for black separatism, was to argue that if God is black, then the only way you shouldn't be involved in any other organizations. And Malcolm, as their lead preacher, began to challenge and change that. As he was involved and in speaking in the university campuses, something started to happen. Um, in, um, in, he saw in um, Harlem, where he was, the shooting down of, of one of his black members, also in New York, who was a, was a, was a black Muslim. And he wanted to challenge this. So he went to the police station on three occasions independently of the Nation of Islam, and said we should challenge the way that the police treated people. Um, it's depicted, actually, in Spike Lee's film, where 4,000 people surround a police station, and then he commands them to be silent, and the police officer goes, no one black person should have that level of power. And if you read Manny Merrill's book, from that moment on, the FBI start to mark him down as a challenge to America. It's important for us to learn this. If you challenge the state... The state begins to look at what you do and begins to the question of undermining you. The Nation of Islam is a conservative right-wing organization that, if you look at Elijah Muhammad, all he was interested in was collecting his Jews. Now, I did this meeting once in New York with 20 Nation of Islam people inside the room. It was a very uncomfortable meeting, comrades, right? Because when you actually describe the nature of the uh, Nation of of Islam. It was an organization that was involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King, sorry, in, uh, of Malcolm X. It was an organization that didn't fund it, although it shouted about racism, didn't want to involve itself inside the struggle. And actually for Malcolm, as he's watching all these things take place in the civil rights movement, and the civil rights movement goes through three periods, from the Montgomery bus, bus point to, to Birmingham, it goes through a period of mass movements. And then it goes through from 62 to 64, a period where it goes through sit-ins. You know, Woolworths, black and white people weren't allowed to go towards the same time. So the students start to get involved in sit-ins. An organization called SNCC is born, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Another organization called CORE is born. 
um, and they both adapt themselves to Martin Luther King's message. Um, as they're going through the struggle, they start to face a question about how you change society and should you take up arms against society. They all argue that you should be non-violent and you should be peaceful. Then in 1964, there's a, a um, in 1960, sorry, in 1963, there's a SNCC meeting and people are asked in the room, are you non-violent? Put up your hands. They put their hands up. Then they're asked, how many people have got a gun in this room? And they all put their hands up. That's called a contradiction, comrades, right? On one hand, you espouse the question of non-violence, and at the same time, you're armed because what you're trying to do to desegregate the South means that you come up against the violence of that. And if you like, Malcolm X's words at the time were uncompromising. He was against integration. He was a black nationalist. What do I mean by a black nationalist? Um, there are several different types of black nationalists, and I don't want to just put it down crudely, but some, a black nationalist in a period where Malcolm X was developing, in the, between, in the 1960s was a period of revolt, of a period of change. And the black nationalism of that time was affected by that, it was affected by people opposing the Vietnam War, it was affected by people demanding rights. And what you start to see happening in the Nation of Islam were people beginning to ask, why doesn't the Nation of Islam join with those people opposing um, the racism that black people are facing inside the southern states? And, it and part of that is what happens to Malcolm in his last year. In his last year, he goes to Los Angeles, where um, people have been killed by the police, and he calls a demonstration. The demonstration is very effective, and the Nation of Islam has been listened to. Um, but the leader of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, didn't want to confront or cause any problems with the state. So he, de he demands that Malcolm X stops doing this. Now, Malcolm sees the way, he begins to change himself. When people say people change, what they mean usually is they read a book and then they change their lives. Actually, that's not how people change. People change in struggle. People change as other people around them begin to stand up and change. And Malcolm X was no different from that. He was a product of that, but he also was also an exponent of, of uh, the question of why you should defend yourself. He actually made a speech. He said that, be peaceful, be courteous, but if somebody puts their hands on you, send them to the cemetery. That's the old religion, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In other words, what he um, put forward was, if you demand for people to bear arms, why can't they bear arms against those people that are oppressing them? He goes, if you come to hang me and I hang you, don't call me an oppressor. In other words, he began to develop those ideas. He also had another set of ideas about who you should trust within the black movement. He was very scathing towards Martin Luther King to those other people because of the question of integration. There's a famous speech in Berkeley with a man called Joe Foreman who led the civil rights movement, the student movement, SNCC, and he attacks him because he's got a white wife. And at the end of that, actually, when you read the, the papers that he wrote from Manny Marable, he says, actually, the reason why I wrote that was because I couldn't really answer Foreman's question about how do we go forward? How do we actually challenge and change racism in the context of the civil rights movement? And actually, in the last year of, of, of his life, and he, when he breaks from the Nation of Islam, he goes through fundamental changes for three reasons. The first, he does go on the Hajj. When he goes on the Hajj, actually finds he's with a multiracial audience. The second thing, he meets the newly liberated black leaders from Africa, the Pan-African leaders, Nkrumah, um, from, you know, he, he meets a whole series of leaders from African leaders who are arguing revolutionary change. When Fidel Castro comes to America, the, one of the great people that greet him is uh, Malcolm X. And really what you see is he reflects the changes that are taking place then. And he argues that if you want to change America, you have to talk about the question of revolution. But part of that change meant breaking with the Nation of Islam. He's kicked out the Nation of Islam for two reasons. Firstly, he questions John F. Kennedy. He says, being an old farm boy myself, when John F. Kennedy is killed, there's a, a mass set of mourning that takes place across the country. I, know, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember the Queen's mum dropping dead, whatever it is, yeah? But imagine jumping up and joy on the TV and say, she's gone at last. Ding. It's a bit like when Margaret Thatcher died, actually. We were all jumping up, going ding dong, the witch is dead. So I remember coming on and people saying, how dare you? How dare you do that? You should never celebrate somebody's death.
death or whatever it is. But actually, the truth is, somebody that attacked us, attacked our class and destroyed everything that we actually stood for and tried to push us back the way that Osborne's trying to push us back, I'm glad that they're gone. And Malcolm X made the same speech. He said that because of the war in Vietnam, he was glad that John F. Kennedy was dead and he was expelled from the Nation of Islam. Um, and if you look to those speeches, when he comes to the Oxford Union, he meets Tariq Ali. And he says to Tariq Ali, I'll be dead within a year. And, he, and Tariq Ali says, why? Because I've done three things that the, the American state will never accept. One, I've argued for an integrated struggle against the fight against racism. He formed an organization called the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And he goes, to be honest, when you begin to challenge the structures in America, that will never be tolerated. He says the second thing um, that he's, he's, um, he begins to argue is that part of that struggle has to be a revolutionary struggle. Now, I would argue that Malcolm X was revolutionary. I would not argue that he was a revolutionary socialist, but I'd argue that he saw the question of changing society coming through mass struggle between, um, against the power structures, and that was the only way to, um, the only way to, um, change, uh, to change America. The third reason was an anti-imperialist. When he attacked um, John F. Kennedy, he accused him of the murder of Patrice uh, Lubumba and the roles that they had been played. Those three things, he said, marked him for death. Now, the people that assassinated him were from the Nation of Islam. They spent 15 years in jail. But it's the first, when he was murdered in February, it's the first time when the FBI and parts of the CIA did not have key people in, by the way, in that room. Why didn't they have key people in that room? Because they would have been armed. And then they would have had to intervene if they saw a felony taking place. So I'm not arguing that the American state killed Malcolm X. What they did is they allowed Malcolm X to be assassinated because he was a threat to what they stood um, for, for part of their ideas of, of, what they, um, of what they stood for. And I think that when we look at um, uh, Malcolm X, you can see that the attitude of him going was, by the New York Times said, um, Malcolm X got what he deserved. Um, he, he produced hate and then he received it. Now, part of the reason why they celebrated was because the question of a voice of uncompromising against racism, they wanted to be silenced. I think that many of the questions that he raised then, when people talk about post-racist society, when you look at the question of the Black Lives Matters tour, are being raised today. I think we have to learn from the lessons of what happened in, in the 1960s about what we can achieve and what we can't achieve. The truth is that we've got a black president, Obama, uh, um, there. We, they even had Eric... Um, Eric, what's his name? God, who's the was the Attorney General, who, who was also black. The three most powerful people in America at one point were three black people. Then why is it that actually conditions for the majority of black people actually got worse? Not just for black people, but for Hispanics, and actually, I would argue for for, for white working class. Two reasons: one, the crisis from two thousand and eight has not the, the crisis of two thousand eight fundamentally put black people in a worse position than they were before. But there's an important caveat to the 60s and, to, and, and today. When you looked at the struggle that took place in America in the 1960s, it produced two movements. It produced that movement over the question of black power, but it also produced movements like the Black Panther Party, and it also produced movements like um, something called DRUM, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, which is going to be discussed in, 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 other, in other movements. The Black Panther Party took on Malcolm X's idea about the question of revolutionary change and won at least 58,000 people to join in that question, that question, but they took further Malcolm X's idea, the question of revolution, and began to integrate in which they described as a Marxist-Leninist view of how to change the world. The weakness, if you like, of Malcolm X's politics were twofold. One, over the question of black and white unity, the idea that you couldn't have uh, a, 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 a revolutionary change that involved an integrated organisation because he said it was automatic that white people would automatically repress black leaders because the lesson of the civil rights movement. I, I think it's something which we, I don't agree with on uh, with, with Malcolm X because I think that the question when he talked about revolutionary change, I think um, you'd, you'd need a, a wider organisation. He actually said contradictory things. He also talked about a man called John Brown. He said it was possible to have unity but with a man called John Brown. John Brown was um, somebody in the American Civil War who took a broadsword and tried to chop off the heads of the slave leaders inside the South in Harper's Ferry, where he talked about the possibility of change coming through those, those people. The question of agency of change was something which Malcolm X really didn't get to discuss at the level which we can talk about today. 
But I do believe his key legacy is that he raised the question of revolution. He raised the question of fighting uh, racism. He raised the question of class differentiation. He talked about house Negroes and he talked about field Negroes. And he talked about people having different, different paths to where they want to go. I believe when you look at America now, when you saw the, the shooting down of people, some of the people being shot down are being shot down by black police officers. Um, why are they doing that? I don't know if you saw in Baltimore, it was justified. If you listen to Obama's speech, he speaks a lot about what's wrong with the family, what's wrong with crime being located in black communities in terms of family, family training. Yet, he presides over a system that continues to push for that level of repression and, uh, repression and hold. And I, I think that if in America, in 1925, somebody can be born that fundamentally questions the whole of society, the potential of radical change taking place in America and taking place in Britain and the chance of racism is the real lesson that we have to take from, from, uh, from, from Malcolm X. We have to take the question of revolutionary change and the challenge for dealing a death to oppression as being its central message. But more importantly, the fact that millions of people listened, millions of people listened to him. Although 15 thousand people went to his funeral. It is instructive that he's one of the most read people in terms of his life today, particularly by Afro-Americans, about the question of change. I think when we talk about how people begin to challenge and change ideas and look for leadership, people look to the ideas of Malcolm X, but we also have to take it further to see what that means in the 21st um, century in the aftermath of Black Lives Matters and also in the aftermath of how we um, get rid of racism uh, 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 once and one, once once and for all, and I think um, I'm going to end up on um, well, anyway, I'm going to end up on a quote where he talked about the Democrat Party. We said at one time they may well change, but their paths in which we're travelling are different paths and different ends. And the reason why I, I raised that was because um, if you read Manny Marable's book, in Manny Marable's, Manny Marable's book, the whole question of what um, is described about, Ma about Malcolm X as a question of reform or revolution. Did, did Malcolm X accept that you could reform society and that would get, rid of, would get rid of racism? I don't believe that's the case. I agree with many of the parts in, in Manny Marable's book. I disagree, with, uh, I disagree with that part. There's other things I want to say, but I've been told to shut up, by, um, to shut up by, by the chair and allow some other people to come in with what, 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 what they think. But I th he remains a, a hero to revolutionaries because he stood the test of time, even though he was cut down. But we have to extend his ideas if we want genuine freedom and genuine change now. So I'll stop there. Um, with what's going on in America, uh, with the kind of um, police violence, the things that are happening, the amount of black people in prisons, would you reckon the likelihood of... Um, then another, being another mass civil rights movement and the, this, you know, ended up in conflict between uh, poor people, Latin Americans and black people confronting the state uh, and the, basically the white police force, which is what the problem is. The, there's a, a, a race and class separation of who has the power and who is in, living in complete poverty. It just feels like uh, if things keep going the way they are, it's going to be back to what happened then? Well, he was right. That, uh, when the film came out, the Spike Lee film came out um, some years ago, whatever, you know, whatever criticism some, some people may or may not rightly have of it, uh, it it's a tremendous, particularly the, the end, the final scenes, and people have seen the film, the final scenes are incredibly moving as he's driving towards, obviously, his ultimate end. And one of the things, one of the, one of many uh, inspiring scenes is that at the end, uh, and people may or may not remember some of this, uh, apologies to some of you who are too young to remember this, but it doesn't really matter in a sense, the number of people you saw at the time, 20 odd years ago when the film came out with the X hats, you know, the X, the X uh, slogan rather on the baseball caps, it wasn't just a fashion thing, it was, it was much more than that, as, as you said, it, it represents something. So he, he becomes an iconic revolutionary, no matter what, Various people in the bourgeoisie and the bourgeois press try and prettify um, some of his ideas and some of what he really stood for and so on. And that, that thing at the start about extremism, and my God, talk about, talk about um, haunting us down the years about extremism. All of us in this room will be seen by 
various people who write the posh papers and so on, and, and the government and all the rest of it, internationally, as, as extremists, you know, by definition, have been here. The SWP, by definition, according to many, is, is an extremist organisation. So that, that it rolls down years how, the, how, these, how these ideological constructs get used again and again and again. And I think it's, you know, like he said, the, 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 the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement is an incredible movement, incredible movement, which did try and work through the contradictions and, uh, as they faced and did... In, in many parts, in many parts, in some parts rather, of Detroit, in the car plants, try and work, work, try and work with white workers. Didn't just see white workers as a completely racist block, in, incapable of changing, and so on. Albeit with 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 huge problems, huge difficulties they faced, um, and, and 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 so on. And I thought as well, it must be incredibly difficult for Malcolm X in in the sense of, amongst all the other ways, what what was there on the left at the time? As, as has been said, that McCarthyism wasn't just about getting rid of people like as they try to um, Humphrey Bogart or film stars and so on, Lauren Bacall, it was fundamentally led by people like Bobby Kennedy, you know, dear liberal Bobby Kennedy. It was about smashing the left, smashing the CP, smashing militants in, the, in, all, kinds of, in all kinds of workplaces and so on. The, C, the CP was a, a pale shadow, largely, uh, partly rather, through, through the McCarthy or witch hunts, through the fact that even... As the CP led, initiated a brilliant campaign, the Scottsboro Boys, they'd been smashed, absolutely hammered. People, you know, people, people's lives were wrecked by McCarthyism um, in, in many, many ways. Some people never worked again. People committed suicide and so on. The left was very much on the defensive. It'd been Stalinized as well. And you could go on. And the last thing I want to say is like all great revolutionaries, Malcolm X never, he didn't stand still. You know, talking about Lenin and Trotsky and Luxembourg, all kinds of great revolutionaries. This, this, this coming few days, and a number of others, he didn't stand still. So the Malcolm X of the early, of the late 50s wasn't the Malcolm X of 1962, 1963, because it's been said his ideas were, were literally revolutionising in a sense. They were constantly moving forward, constantly challenging himself. Very last thing is, you know, it, it, it's incredible really that the Dylan Roof, the Dylan Roof bloke who shot, shot eight people in the church a few weeks ago and, and all the fury about the, the Confederate flag, it's incredible. And then Obama's speech a few days after, I, I don't know what people know, but I thought this couldn't be true, but it was true. After Dylan Roof was arrested, the fucking Nazi was arrested, he said he felt hungry, so the police took him for a meal. And then they arrested him. I mean, Jesus, unbelievable, but true. Um, as opposed to as opposed to everything else that we know, and the other thing, you know, Obama's speech was very interesting. You know, Obama, yes, we can. All the rest of it. After nearly eight years, he makes a speech where, even as liberal commentators said, he seemed shock, horror, genuinely angry about about the way of the world in America. Well, he was, he is, was, is the president in America. He does have some power to change this. And in fact, again, the Confederate flag today is being taken down in South Carolina. Finally. You know, it says a lot about how we've gone forward in some ways, huge, hugely steps forward in America, but, but, but also incredibly, in many ways, steps backward as well. I think Wehrman, Wehrman mentioned it in his, in his speech about Islamophobia. It's, I think it, where Malcolm could be really important in the coming struggle, because we've just had an election, you know, probably one of the most racist elections in the last 20 years, where immigration has been put on the, you know, it's been put on Labour Party monks, it's that bad that the Labour Party have played the, the sort of immigration card. And what we're seeing, I was brought up in Blackburn. Blackburn's got probably a 35% Asian community. Um, I can remember my dad telling me about 10 years ago, he said, the racism in Blackburn is bad. It is so bad that there is segregation between the white community and the Asian community. I said, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And I looked at it, and, and you think what the ruling class have given over, over the election, for instance, and it's been an insipid drip, drip, drip of this Islamophobic racism. And I think where Malcolm X comes in important, what, it's, what this racism has done... I feel, and it might be controversial, is that it's, it's made the Asian community become insular. And then you get the stories about Syria. And the media absolutely blow it into, out of all proportion. And I think what is important is how we could make a connection with, rather than, you know, the Asian community becoming insular, 
and the conservative side of the Asian community taking control, etc. What we could do is use the politics of Malcolm X as Malcolm was learning through his through going to the Hajj, etc. And I think we could use that to draw back or to draw in the you know the Asian youth into a re sort of a stream of revolutionary consciousness. I think um, that was a, a really good start to Marxism, so thank Raymond for, for his introduction. I think one of the comments that made me think was when he said that um, a black life wasn't worth two cents in America. And I think what we've seen in Ferguson and in Baltimore you know, shows that that still, to many Americans, is the case. The amount of, of deaths at the hand of the American state of young black people um, shows that their lives still do not matter. I think it was um, really interesting to see how Malcolm X's life was influenced by air uh, factors um, and how he changed uh, throughout, um, firstly um, through his imprisonment and his relationship with the Nation of Islam, but secondly, uh, later on, um, how he was becoming more revolutionary and how he was being influenced by, by other sources, including many men on his head. I've got um, a question uh, to Raymond about the Black Lives Matter um, tour and the people involved and how they are influenced by Malcolm X or is the civil rights um, movement more of an influence to them? But I think, you know, we can't talk about racism without talking about capitalism and the, and the need to change the system. We need to get rid of a system that exploits people for the, the majority of people for the profits of the minority. And I think we're seeing the same um, with the um, racist violence that still exists in America as we're seeing in the Mediterranean with migrants, you know, being left to die in the sea because uh, capitalism is, to, is more important and keeping um, workers down and keeping the workers um, as a, you know, oppressed is more important to the system than saving lives. Just had a couple of points. Uh, when we talked earlier about uh, you know, the ideas of one book can change your life. It definitely was a book, The Speeches of Malcolm X, which was uh, lent to me around the time of the film as a young teenager. And it was a point that brought me not quite close to the party at that time, but it distanced me from my parents who basically couldn't believe that I was reading this book. So one book can change your life <laughs> in that way. But uh, I just had a question. Um, I'm glad you brought up the Black Panther Party who described themselves as the heirs of Malcolm X. And I wondered uh, in what ways you felt that they were successful or unsuccessful in that way. Yeah, just three quick thoughts about um, things that Wayman was discussing about Malcolm X and that resonate with questions that we face today. One, um, there's quite a widespread view amongst sections of the kind of, uh, amongst liberals and some people on the left, that religion in general and Islam in particular is always a reactionary worldview. Uh, Malcolm X was a black Muslim who, uh, for whom religion in Islam was an idiom in which he explored and developed as a revolutionary. Secondly, I think Malcolm X's life draws us to think about something that's very central that we have to confront as socialists, which is the relationships between oppression uh, and exploitation. Capitalism's constantly seeking ways to divide people, divide and rule, to survive, to rule over the majority. Uh, in this case, Malcolm X confronting the question of racism against black people. There's many other forms of it that exist. Um, it, it oils the wheels of exploitation, of pumping out the profits if you keep people divided. Malcolm X radicalized against oppression. He radicalized as a black man experiencing anti-black racism in American society rather than first and foremost as a worker. But it raises questions about how do you smash oppression? How do you create a revolution? What forces do you need to defeat American imperialism? Think about that as a project. Um, it means mobilizing black and white workers uh, who are the majority and who have the collective power and the common interest through exploitation to strike blows against racism. These are questions you have to think about. They're questions Malcolm X was thinking about. 
But thirdly, that raises a question about how do you start to win white people away from racism? And just a, a final thought, um, unfortunately because there's no mobile signal, I can't, I can't find... I, I saw an article a few a couple of months ago, I think it was the Washington, Time, uh, Washington Post or New York Times, that, that said that uh, since the Black Lives Matter movement emerged, there's been a shift amongst white people's attitude to the police. Not particularly amongst black people, they know <laughs> what the police do. Uh, why has it been a shift? And they, I mean, I can't remember the gist of it was... 10, 15% of white people have become much more sceptical about the police's claims about why black people die when they come into contact. Now, in the size of America, that's probably 20, 30 million people shifting their attitude. Maybe temporarily, but it gives you a glimpse of how change happens. Why has it happened? Not because black people are being killed by the police, because that's a constant in America, a shocking constant. What's changed is there's mass protests about it. And it's, it's, a, it's a truth that we constantly state that protest changes you. People change in protest. What's interesting is that sometimes the kind of ripples of that change sometimes hit some of the people who are not necessarily protesting. But look at the protests, hear the arguments, and start to rethink some of their assumptions about society. So the emergence of a mass movement against police racism and police killings and what the state is doing to black people in America has had an impact on 10, 15 million white people in America. You get a glimpse of how massive struggles can start to destroy some of these old, crappy ideas that poison people's minds and lay at least a potential for unity that can really strike blows against imperialism. Yeah, just a quick question, actually, in the contribution. Um, the quick question is, um, some of you would have seen the new prevent stuff in, in schools at the moment, which is effectively criminalising people for their ideas rather than their actions. I want to know what Wayman thought. Um, is this a new McCarthyism, really? Um, as a question, just in terms of contribution, I, th I think when we talk about um, the legacy of Malcolm as being a revolutionary, um, I think it's, it's absolutely right, and he's been vindicated. People talk about Ferguson, they talk about Baltimore and, and New York. Um, Fifty years since his death, yet black people's lives are, are still worthless in America. And Wayman started by talking about Smevik. What happened in Smevik in the 60s? Um, we had Tories putting out a campaign, if you want a nigger as a neighbour, vote Labour. This year we see Farage able to say um, you should be worried about living next door um, to a Romanian. So actually we, we see racism um, continually manifest itself under this system. But so we, we should take that for Malcolm, the actual thought of being a revolutionary, the fact that we need system change, not just to reform it, but we should go further. We've had a fantastic struggle in this country of black and white people uniting and fighting against racism. This is crucial, and you can see these lessons in America now. Is it the start of the civil rights, a new civil rights movement? We don't know, but actually you can see it in Ferguson. There were black and white people together learning the lessons of, of how you fight racism together. And in, in terms of system, system change... We're absolutely right to, to, to go further than Malcolm and, and argue for that. Where does power lie? Anyone who sees these RMT strikes today, um, absolutely fantastic. Um, the workplace gives us a fantastic opportunity, not just to, um, through struggle, bring black and white people together, but actually to start to challenge the system um, through the workplace as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, comrades, for, for what you've said. I, I think what's remarkable about America and the fact that it gave rise to Malcolm X, is that question. If in the country of the American dream that people can become a revolutionary and question what's going on, why did that happen? That happened because of contradictions that, were, that, that happened there. I was asked about the rise of the Black Panther Party and that, that period. You see, when Malcolm X died in 1965, actually, if you look today, compare then and now, what happened was there was a backlash to the civil rights movement. You know, Nixon and all these people, was a backlash to it because the idea was that if the civil rights movement goes forward, actually white workers lose. But the information is very, very clear. Wherever um, black workers or that described as third world workers went forward, Hispanic black workers went forward, white wages went up. Even in America now, there's a difference between healthcare in the South and in the North. The greater unionization in the North, the greater the integration in the North led to people having 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 uh, having having more rights america is a country that's got explosive change and part of the reason why you've seen that change taking place now mark you know it was mentioned that the the figures showed that people are identifying with black lives matter why because actually when you look at the impact of 2008 in 1964 um, white workers income went up three times to date fallen from uh, before. In other words, what the ruling class tell us and what people's experience are different. And what's the role of the police? 
The police is stick and carrot, isn't it? And the truth is, they haven't got much carrot. I don't know if people were excited about Osborne's, uh, you know, he's referee. I'm going to cut money for the rich, and I'm going to cut the welfare state, and it's going to be good for you, all right? No, I, I think in America, you've seen those cuts take place, and people are beginning to question, uh, begin to question what's happened. Today, there isn't, because of that backlash, it was difficult to form, uh, to form an easy answer for people like uh, uh, Malcolm X. The left had been smashed by the McCarthyite witch hunt. You know the civil rights movement? The people that led it in the black American churches were ex-CP um, ex children. You know, people that were forming in the... If you want to know what happened to the American civil the, um, CP, it went into the black churches in the southern states. That's part of the reason why they had that method in, uh, in, order, in order to change and fundamentally fight, um, uh, uh, fight now. I was asked a question about... As well as the question of the Black Panther Party, the Black Panther Party, again, reflected that change of revolutionary change. Um, I don't know if people have heard of F.B. Um, Hoover, a man called uh, Hoover... The, he, when he wrote his um, memoirs about the Black Panther Party, he could barely talk. He was screaming into the, to the store over because I can't believe it. He said, I've dedicated my entire life to making sure there wasn't resistance. And then I have a party that calls itself Marxist-Leninist that's not only supported by millions of black people, but white people like it as well. We've got to do something about it. And they did do something about it, actually. They, they ideologically attacked them and they used military political force. If you want to understand where SWAT came from, you know, the special weapons attack teams, it was based to smash the Panthers' organisation because they were arguing for change in, 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 in society. The tragedy of the Panthers is that they took from part of Malcolm's the idea of the agency of change. How do you actually change society? Um, I believe that the working class is the agency of change of society. How do I know that? It was mentioned, I mentioned it briefly, the Detroit, the drum revolutionary union movement. The Panthers had at least 20% of their members killed, their leadership. In fact, I think today Mamaya is in, um, dying in prison still today as a consequence. That's how much the American state feared and hated what was going, uh, what, what, what was, uh, going on. But the Dodge Revolutionary Movement was influenced by a man called C.L.R. James and Panthers and all these other people organised inside the car factory. They didn't shoot down their leaders. Why? Because at that time, the car factories were the centre of production. And if you shot down the leaders of the movement, they would have to go into the car factories in order to do that, and they weren't prepared to do that. And that tells you about power. It's not because they were afraid. They were afraid of what happens if those workers went out and strike, and it hit the heart of America at that particular, at that particular time. So the Panthers, I, I, I believe the key question of the Panthers was it shows the question of building a revolutionary party in America that could have grown, but they had a strategy of not having an integrated multiracial party. I, I think today the conditions are are much more likely for a bigger multiracial uh, condition. When you look at the Black Lives Matters, I thought the most amazing thing were the doctors. I don't know if you saw the white coats lying down doing the dines. And they said, why are you doing this? They said, because we see the kids that the police shoot down and kill. And when we ask them, why did you shoot them? There's never a good reason. Now, that tells you something about the potential for, uh, uh, for change inside America. It's a more divided society than it's ever been. And actually, for many people, the American dream is turning into an American nightmare, as, uh, as, 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 as Malcolm X talked about. When you look at Prevent, the demonization of Muslims across the world, it tells you something, actually, because if in a black America they can produce somebody like Malcolm X, that process can happen anywhere, actually. The question of, I believe that we, there will be leaders produced like that. But I, w I would like them not to get gunned down like Malcolm X, to be honest. I would like them to understand about how to change. The tragedy of Malcolm X was, he posed the question, didn't he? He posed it, here I am, challenging you, calling you hypocrites. But the question was, why didn't he win? As I don't say that because Martin Luther King, what happened to Martin Luther King when he went to the strike of the dust workers? They, they said you can have civil rights. But as soon as he supported the strikes, he went to Memphis said that black and white workers should be paid the same, he was dead. As soon as Malcolm X raised the question of imperialism and challenged society, and he had influence of people, they killed him. Now, all of us in here want longevity, all right? So it's not a minor question. And sometimes people, actually in the movement, I've been told by people, all you need to do is show determination, yeah? Be more revolutionary, be more young and angry than anybody else, and you'll win. Now, I think we owe it's a duty to look at what happened to Malcolm X and not use his life as a legacy about how not to repeat the same mistakes in order to go forward. It's not true if you're revolutionary enough, you'll automatically win. 
You have to have three combinations. You have to have the knowledge and the understanding of what you're up against, but also the means to be able to do it. You see, Malcolm X was in a tiny minority when he called for revolution in the late 50s, actually. He talked about America can never change. Tiny minority. But by 1968, after the big uprisings, his voice began to fit more. And I believe when you look at the struggles taking place today, the potential of our voices fitting more is, is much more the case. But I believe they are going to use racism. What is prevent about non-violent extremists, they say? People that question what's going on. I saw a four-year-old child say that Palestine, it's not fair how the Palestinians are treated, sent off to the prevent officer. I'd call that intelligence. Do you know what I mean? One person's treated badly, one person's treated well, you call it intelligence. Actually, they begin to criminalise those people those people in order to shut to shut them up i think we have to launch a mass campaign against prevent because prevent is trying to prevent what happened today when we had the strike and it's trying to prevent what happened today when we have the strike the question of power and how you change society is vital i don't know if anybody visited the picket lines of the tube workers today they're very small whatever it is because they knew they'd shut down everything right but they're very mixed weren't they you sat down there and you looked through and you saw they were very mixed people didn't start from the division that they had. Everybody started off, I won't repeat, but people called Boris, um, Boris Johnson an unmentionable name that I won't use among socialists when I went down to talk to them and say why he should be stopped. It's about, the real question about how you change society is a question of revolution. And, and I believe both in Britain and America, we have to defend what we've got, but we are approaching a much more difficult stage. How can you explain what's going on in Greece? How can you explain the crisis that's taking place there? It is also a drive towards racism, but it's also a pull towards challenging it. I, know, I, won't mention, I won't embarrass them, but there are people here that have been challenged, told that they're refugees, they're not allowed to be inside this country, and they got their fellow sisters to come together to say, I won't be chucked outside this country, I'll stand together in unity against that. I'll embarrass Man Salim. She stands here and stands there as a, as a Muslim woman who gets up and speaks out against Islamophobia, and when she speaks, people listen and join in and say that we support you. So there's also people that try and push racism, but there's also resistance against it. And, and for me, you know, I, I think we've reached a point where if we want fundamental change, it's so naked in America. You know when they shot down that seven-year-old child, because he left 11-year-old child because he was holding a toy pistol, and you read that the police officer said he shouldn't be holding a weapon. That's what they said, he shouldn't be holding a weapon to confuse people. They shot him in less than six seconds. That means that they don't care about our lives. But you know what? I don't think they care about anybody's lives. When they cut grants for people and say, if you have more than three children, you're not going to get any benefits, what does that really mean? It means the Tories are inventing the new word urchin. As I remember, you used to be in something, there's something called an urchin. What's an urchin? It's a child that nobody in the family can afford to supply. I used to read a book called Jude the Obscure in order to understand what an urchin was, because they said that's the only way you're going to pass your A-levels. If you understand what an urchin, they're reinventing the same process, but trying to get us to divide and fight against each other. If you think that, then part of... I think what Marxism is about is developing and sharpening, learning the lessons of Malcolm X in order that our revolution that we face is much more, um, is much more successful. I have seen black revolutionary uh, movements challenge states. It's in Egypt. I saw black women come out and challenge the state inside Tahrir Square. They led a revolution in the Arab Spring. That potential exists both in Britain and here. The real question is... When it goes forward, how do we continue, or as Trotsky's phrase, permanent revolution, how do we achieve it to go forward, and how do we win other people around us to be stronger in order to do that? The first thing I'd argue is that you need a revolutionary party. Malcolm X wanted to form an organisation, was looking for one. Thankfully, they built one here, it's called the SWP. And you know, I, I strongly recommend that people uh, join it. The second is we need thousands of women who are Malcolm X's, thousands of men that are Malcolm X's. We need a movement that can actually lead to that. You saw little bits of that on the People's Assembly demonstration. But more than anything, we need the strikes that we hear today to take place on a much greater scale. Um, I know I have to end up on this, but you know, I don't know if you saw what they said. They said they're doing a disservice to London. I want a disservice to London, Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow, wherever it is. I want a disservice everywhere 
because the only people that they're doing a disservice to is the ruling class in this country that fill their pockets, destroy our lives, push racism, attack migrants, and are busy wrecking this world. There's money for weapon systems, but there's not money to feed people. The questions that Mark and Max raised are now here with us today. I, I, I think that Marxism is to try and provide answers to that. If you agree with that, please join us, but more important, join us in both the struggle to change the world and to talk about the means necessary as being revolution and fighting for a socialist society. I'll stop there.